we're going to turn now to our keynote presentation here, which is from uh, Dr. Robert Watson. And he's about to take the stage and uh, talk about uh, really the relationship of climate change and biodiversity and land degradation and sustainability writ large. Uh, it would have been hard for us to find a better person than Bob to give this talk, and it was just an incredibly fortuitous circumstance that our event aligned in a way with his schedule, which is complex to say the least. But but Bob's done a lot of different things. He uh, he's been a senior environment official in both the UK government and in several different places in the U.S. government. He was a senior scientist in the NASA mission to planet earth program and was in fact the chief scientist of that program for quite a while from there he went on to the white house where he was the first uh associate director for environment of the office of science and technology policy that's kind of a mouthful but ostp is the office that the president's science advisor runs and as the associate director bob was the senior advisor on environmental science for the whole U.S. government in the Clinton-Gore administration. He was the first person to hold that position, actually. Uh, he went from there to the World Bank, where he was the chief scientist of the World Bank and ran the Environment Division of the World Bank. Then he went from there to uh, back to the U.K., where he's from, even though he'd been in the U.S. for a long time, and he worked for uh, DEFRA, which is the Department of Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs. I don't think DEFRA exists anymore. I think it was reorganized out of existence and he also played a role as the chief scientist of the Tyndall Center in the UK. In addition to all these positions, I think uh, the most interesting thing uh, about Bob is that he's been the real modern champion of the process of scientific assessment. He played a key role in devising the ozone assessment sponsored by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program that looked at all the evidence around ozone depletion uh, really nailed down the reality of the ozone hole and helped stimulate action uh, to address that issue from all the world's governments. From there, he went on and had a big role in working group two of the IPCC, but then became chair of the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's the main scientific assessment body that advises the international negotiating process under the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, he found time in there to also do the first global biodiversity assessment and is now currently the chair of a major international panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services, the IPBES. So that's doing a very large assessment as well. And then he also did some climate change and food security assessment in between all those other things as well. So he, he's been a champion of this process of scientific assessment, which is bringing the scientific knowledge to bear on the decision-making processes of international and national governments. So as I think you can all grasp from the discussions we've had thus far today, you know, there just isn't anything more important than that in the sustainability world, trying to bring science and decision-making together. And so with that, uh, let's welcome Bob to the stage and hear what he has to say. Thank you, Bob. Well, first, let's say it was an honor to be invited uh, to this meeting. I worked with Peter at NASA and in the White House, and so I owed him, basically, uh, when I... Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, so, what I want to talk about is human-induced climate change, loss of biodiversity, land degradation, but fundamentally, why are they important? And hopefully... Ah, fine. So, I'm going to quickly talk about what are the threats to development, what is it best, which is now what I chair. I'm going to talk about some of the very key findings from four regional assessments and one on land degradation and restoration. Have a quick talk about human induced climate change, uh, talk about how the two interplay against each other, and what are the implications for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I think this slide basically summarizes. So if you don't listen to any other part of the talk, this is it. We humans are destroying biodiversity. We're degrading our ecosystems. Uh, we're causing land degradation, and we're changing the Earth's climate. 
These are not just environmental issues. They're development issues. They're economic issues. They're social, security, and ethical issues. And this is what we have to get across to people. They really are fundamental to human well-being, whether in a rich country or a poor country. And unfortunately, most of the problems are being caused by the rich countries, and the people most adversely impacted are poor people in developing countries. There are 20 so-called biodiversity Aichi targets. I'll come to those later. They will not be met by most countries in most parts of the world. The 1.5 to 2 degree uh, target of the Paris Agreement will not be met, not with the current pledges anyway. And the time for action is clearly now, and in fact the time for action was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago. And the message is there's a whole bunch of big environmental assessments. There's GO6 run by UNEP. There's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There's ITBES. And we're all saying the same things. We need rapid, transformative changes across the world if we're going to deal with climate, loss of biodiversity, and land degradation. And if we don't deal with them, we will not meet most of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So what is biodiversity? You know this. It's basically at the genetic level, the species level, and the ecosystem level. I'm going to talk about nature's a little bit. Nature's contribution for people is another terminology for what most people talk about ecosystem goods and services. So nature's contribution for people, there are regulating material and non-material. Very similar to regulating ecosystem services, provisioning ecosystem services, and cultural ecosystem services. But for a reason I'll talk about for a couple of seconds, we've moved away from ecosystem services to talking about nature's contribution from people. You can see what they are, the regulating ones, such as climate, fresh water, uh, the material ones, food, uh, fiber, energy, medicines, uh, the more cultural uh, ones and non-material, learning and inspiration, identity, etc. All of them feed into quality of life, uh, both relational and instrumental. And so clearly, this is the structure that we use uh, for it best. You all know about these 17 sustainable development goals. And what I'll sort of show at the end is most of these cannot be met unless we deal with climate change and loss of biodiversity, and land degradation, which is why I say those issues are not just environmental, they are development issues, economic issues, etc. Well, we're very similar to IPCC. We're a science policy platform, but we deal with biodiversity and ecosystems rather than climate change. We currently have 130 governments that are members. We want a strength and knowledge foundation for better policy. We do assessments at the request of government, and I call them scientific assessments, but this is natural science, social science, the humanities, economists, technologists, lawyers, business. So science with a very big S, and the social sciences are ju and humanities just as important as the natural. And the equally important, we not only use what I call modern science, but indigenous and local knowledge is absolutely critical. And I would argue that in it best, we've made more progress on trying to bring together indigenous and local knowledge with the knowledge that comes out of universities and think tanks than any previous assessments. We assess knowledge, we stimulate new research, we use and develop policy tools, and we have a lot of work on capacity building. Uh, we've already finished a series of assessments, pollination, scenarios, and models. The four regional assessments I'll talk about today, land degradation. Our big global assessment will be finished in May of this year, but we've already started one on values, the diverse conceptualization of values, just not economic, market, and non-market, but also social values. We're doing one on sustainable use of wild species, and we're just starting one on invasive alien species. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the, the results from these four assessments. What's critical is the conceptual framework we use. And what you'll notice is there's two colors, green and sort of uh, purple. 
The green one is more the way Western science thinks about things. We have biodiversity and ecosystems. They provide ecosystem goods and services, or nature's contributions for people, it is a macro term, and human well-being. But there's also the way indigenous people think about it, more Mother Earth, systems of life, leading to nature's gifts, leaving with living in harmony with nature. These two conceptual frameworks fit together beautifully, which means which why we have to use all forms of knowledge and our complete diverse eco value systems. They're driven by the direct drivers. We talk about anthropogenic assets and we talk about institution and governance, and that'll come out in my talk. It's clearly a, uh, a conceptual framework that can be used at almost any spatial scale and any temporal scale. We typically have for the regional assessments, we set the scene, why is biodiversity uh, an issue? Uh, how does it contribute to the quality of life? What's the status, the trends, and the future dynamics? What are the direct and indirect drivers of change? How could biodiversity plausibly change in the future? We go out to 2050, 2060 normally. And what are the options for action? So what are the key findings? Even though there are four very, very different regions of the world, there's a huge amount of similarity uh, amongst those four regions of the world, although they are, of course, some modest differences in the trends, the way they relate to human uh, well-being. Uh, clearly, biodiversity and nature's contribution is essential, essential is the word, for a good quality and healthy life. They provide food, clean water, they regulate climate, they regulate air quality, floods, pollination services, and they're fundamental to social cohesion, mental well-being, etc. Biodiversity has both economic, both market value, things that you buy and sell in the market, food, energy, fiber, but they have a lot of non-market value, the value of controlling our climate, our air quality, the pollination services, and of course, they have social or non-economic value. It's very context-specific, and it depends on one's worldview. And the worldview of an indigenous person living in the Amazon forest is probably very different for most of you in this particular audience. And we have to understand those very different worldviews. Biodiversity at all levels continues to degrade in all parts of the world. And in fact, about 20%, this comes from the IUCN Red List, 20% of all assessed species are threatened now with extinction. And endemic species, even more threatened than that other species. This just simply shows you uh, this one, and I'm going to intersperse some of the results from Africa, some from the Americas, some from uh, ECHA, that's uh, Europe and Central Asia, uh, and some from the Americas. This one comes from Africa. And what you can see is we looked at, in different parts of Africa, how valuable are mangrove systems, how va valuable are fisheries, what about carbon sequestration, what about erosion protection. These numbers are probably a little bit soft. They're somewhat uncertain. But the main point of this is these natural assets do have real value that need to be taken into account when politicians make decisions. We looked at the same thing for the Americas, and they estimated that the annual value of na nature's contribution equals the GDP of the Americas. That could be wrong by a factor of two. It could actually be wrong by a factor of five. It would still be important. So even if these numbers are uncertain, the fact is there is economic value, both market and non-market. What have we done? In the Americas, this one, we've lost 95% already of tall grass prairies. We lost 50% of tropical savannas. Even recently, coral reefs, only 10% remained by 20, 2003. 9.5% of forest areas, South America, 25% in Mesa, has been lost in the recent time. So we've not only got long-term changes in biodiversity, we're still destroying it today. And this shows the uh, IUCN red list. This is from Asia Pacific. All the other three regions would look very, very similar to this. So we broke it down by region. Green means they're near threatened. Yellow means they are vulnerable. Red means they're critically endangered. Black means they're extinct. And in the bars, 
basically show you overall what do we view as threatened that could go extinct in the coming decades. And as you can see, it, they all line up around 0 0.2, 0 0.25. In other words, 20-25% of all species that we've assessed are threatened with extinction. This looks at some of the trends in biodiversity. This one comes from the Eka region, Europe and Central Asia. And effectively, we've looked at a whole series of terrestrial systems. We've looked at a whole series of freshwater systems and marine systems. We only did near coastal. We didn't do the open ocean in the regional assessments. And we looked at the long-term past, the last 50 years. But then we've looked at the, like, the present, i.e. the last five to 10 years. What you can see fundamentally is biodiversity is going down in just about every single ecosystem and in each one of these sub-regions of ECHA. You'd have got exactly the same thing in the other regions, and this indeed summarizes it. Africa, the Americas, Asia, Pacific, Europe and Central Asia. It doesn't matter if you're looking at the terrestrial system, freshwater system, or marine. We are losing biodiversity at the genetic species and ecosystem level and that's effectively what the first bullet says we are losing and degrading ecosystems all over the world why that's the crucial thing basically we've really focused on producing material contributions for people which we need producing food fiber energy but as we've produced food fiber and energy we've done it in such a way We've actually re degraded all of our ecosystems. It's undermined the pollination services, undermined uh, regulating climate and air quality, undermined the more cultural, the non-material, the learning and aspirational. And in fact, a, an FAO assessment that came out uh, only a couple of weeks ago also demonstrated the important links between agriculture and biodiversity and recognize that agriculture to date in all terrestrial cities has been the major driver for loss of biodiversity. In the open oceans, it's overfishing. overfishing. So the two key, and there's about five indirect drivers, but the two key ones are changes in population and changes in economic wealth. Those two together lead to changes in consumption patterns and the demand for more food, more energy, more fiber. And effectively, they are the major issues. So as I've already said, it's the conversion and fragmentation of terrestrial ecosystems, over-exploitation in the oceans, and climate change is likely to become the major driver over the next several decades. This shows you what happens to those nature's contributions for people. Uh, down the left-hand side, basically, we have the different sort of ecosystems. Along the top, we have the different types of uh, material, non-material, and regulating. You, I mean, these slides are available to all of you. They'll be on the computer. If anyone uh, wants them, I'm sure Peter can uh, let you have them, basically. But what you see fundamentally is many of the arrows at best are horizontal, meaning things are somewhat stable, but many of the arrows are going down, except the ones right on the very bottom, where it says agriculture, what's going up is food and fiber, etc. And it's that trend of continually demanding more food in the way we have for agriculture. It can be sustainable. There is no question. Agriculture can be, but not the way we do it today. This summarizes then about nature's contribution for people, again, across the four regions. And as you can see, what we've largely said is the material ones, food, fiber, energy, are going up. The regulating and the non-material are going down. Same broad picture right across the world. This now talks about, well, what are the drivers, basically? Well, the direct drivers are climate change. Uh, they're overfishing or overexploitation. They're habitat conversion, as I said, alien invasive species, uh, pollution. And there's only one message. All of the drivers are going up. So no wonder we're losing biodiversity. In all regions of the world, in all sub-regions of the world, all of these drivers are going in one direction. Asia-Pacific, same message, basically, that you see the direct drivers along the top and you see what the arrows are. There's a few that have basically stabilized, uh, but in most cases, what we're seeing is the drivers are going up, 
we're losing biodiversity in all of these things, whether it's an agroecosystem, whether it's a forest and woodland, whether it's an island or a mountain. And if this is more just to show you the level of detail we looked in. We did the same effectively in ECHA. We took all, all, our sort of our, all of our ecosystems and we looked effectively at all the direct drivers. We looked even in the sub-regions and the picture is the same. The drivers are going up, some very, very strongly, uh, and some are going up maybe a bit weaker. <coughs> this summarizes it. Land use change, a major driver in all four regions. Climate change, uh, increasingly a major driver. Uh, alien invasive species, pollution, and extraction of resources, all going in one direction. It's not surprising we're not meeting our biodiversity targets when we haven't got to grips with the very things that are destroying biodiversity. So uh, continuing on, a key thing to note, however, synergistic effects. Climate change interacts and amplifies all of the other drivers. It's not just climate change alone. It interacts with over-exploitation. It interacts with pollution, etc. Now, you could say there's some really good news. We've got more terrestrial uh, protected areas. We have more marine protected areas. And that is indeed good news. But much of the key biodiversity in the world is not in a protected area. And many of those protected areas are not well managed. And also, the fauna and flora in those protected areas is likely to change as climate changes and the boundaries move poleward and upwards in elevation in both hemispheres. So the basic point is, yeah, protected areas are good, especially if you manage them well, but most biodiversity will always remain outside of protected areas. Therefore, the challenge is, how do we protect the biodiversity outside of the protected areas? Therefore, we have to integrate concerns about biodiversity into all socioeconomic sectors, agriculture, water, energy, transportation, infrastructure, and cities. This means we must have cross-departmental uh, uh, collaboration within government, which rarely occurs, having now worked in both the American government in the White House and our high level in the U UK government, and it needs close collaboration with both the private sector and civil society. Business as usual, if we continue as we carry on, we're just going to continue to lose biodiversity. If we focus on economic growth, we're going to, have to lose biodiversity at an even faster rate than we're doing it now. But there are scenarios, sustainability scenarios, that can have positive outcomes. We have to think about nature. We have to think about climate change. We have to integrate those concerns about biodiversity, land degradation, pollution, into the way we manage agriculture, water, transportation. And if we integrate the concerns about what are thought to be environmental issues, but recognizing their development and economic issues, we can have a much more sustainable future, but we're not going in the right direction at the moment. We're going to see increases in population. By 2050, the population of the Americas will go up by another 20%. For the Americas, we recognize if we continue doing agriculture the way we're doing it now, especially combined with climate change, they will be ma the major drivers for the loss of biodiversity in most terrestrial uh, ecosystems. This very, the black line on this, the one that starts low and goes even lower, that's business as usual. That's what will happen. The other lines like, is, uh, can actually show, and you see around 2020, if we start to think about how to use technology, how we start to think about sustainability, we can bend the curve. In most of these scenarios, though, we are still losing biodiversity, but at least we're losing it at a slower rate. And this, again, we, t we actually uh, we did not have time to run common scenarios in all four regions, but we did run business as usual continuing global sustainability, international cooperation and regulations that recognize the importance of environmental affairs, regional solutions, participate, local participatory decision-making, being aware of the environment, 
Free markets, just economic growth. Uh, trade barriers, a very fragmented world with b lots of social inequality. And consumption change. How can we as individuals make a difference? How do we make sure we conserve energy, use it sustainably? How do we make sure we don't w waste food? Lots of, we don't waste water. Lots of things we can individually do. So if you look at this, the global uh, business as usual, everything gets worse. Global sustainability, things can get better, or the up and down arrow means it, you know, there's variations across the world. Regional solutions, again, a lot better in business as usual. Free markets, uh, we lose biodiversity, we lose regulating services. Trade barriers, equally bad. But consumption change, think about consumption at the individual level and at the community level also can make a positive difference. So the 20 Aichi targets, I've already said it, very few will be met anywhere in the world, especially including the richest countries of the world. And by not meeting the Aichi targets, we will be undermining many of the sustainable development goals. We can conserve and sustainably use biodiversity with integrated multi-sectoral policies. We need different institutional arrangements. We need adequate finances, we need appropriate technologies, and we need behavior change at the individual community, government, and, and uh, uh, private sector level, basically. And it all is based on how do we have sustainable production and consumption. So ecosystem approaches will indeed be very key to both help maintain sustainably used biodiversity, but also good for climate change. We need much more inclusive and participatory governance systems, polycentric systems. They, they're needed at the national, subnational, regional, and global level. They must include all key players government, private sector, civil society, and indigenous peoples and local communities, IPLCs. And if you do that, hopefully we can all ask what is our vision for the future? If people can agree on a vision, you've got more chance of ownership, more chances of having the laws you need or the regulations you need or the financial incentives, more chance of getting behavior change at the individual level or the community level. And yes, there are knowledge gaps, obviously, otherwise your careers would be short. Uh, but we know enough to do a hell of a lot better than we're doing now. Oops, sorry. So this is on the Aichi targets on the very right-hand side in blue. They're the ones we're likely to meet. This just comes from Africa. If we did it, it's a number of countries. So the first one says seven countries will actually meet the target of increasing awareness. 29 countries are making some progress. That's green. 11, basically, no significant change. And the uh, green is where we have no information. So blue is good. Not very much blue on there. Green means, yes, we're making some progress, but orange and red basically says we're not making any progress. And if it's red, we're moving away from the target. We're doing worse today than we were doing in 2010 when we set these targets. And if you look at the other four regions, three regions of the world, you get exactly the same picture. So what can we do? We need to think short-term and long-term. We need to think about telecompany. What we do here in America, how does it affect Brazil? How does it affect the Congo? There's a lot of international trade. We need to recognize telecompany is a key issue in trying to be sustainable, not just in our own country, but in other countries, basically. Um, I've already said, we need to mainstream the environment into all economic and social systems. We need behavior change, as I've already said. There's a series of policy options. There are regulatory mechanisms. There are incentive mechanisms. There's right-based approaches. We need all of them. There is no magic silver bullet. We need every one of these. You can't read this, and I don't blame you, but what we tried to do in ECHA what were all of the various uh, policies that you can think about? To what degree were they actually being implemented or thought about? And this is ECHA. This is Europe, which along with the US and other uh, Western countries, you would think would be in good shape. We're not. We're in terrible shape in actually imp designing and implementing policies, even in Europe. And actually, the US is no better, if not worse. 
So on land degradation and restoration, they took a global perspective. Shouldn't surprise you what we found. Land degradation is virtually occurring everywhere in the world. It's actually getting worse everywhere in the world. Uh, why? Overconsumption uh, of goods, especially food, very similar to what I've said before. A decoupling, a telecoupling, decoupling where people eat a product, say food, and where it's actually grown. So we don't see the destruction, so we don't care about it, basically. Um, and also, a lot of governments have not quite come to grips that land degradation is a critical issue that we need to uh, look at fragmented policy to say the least so we've got to think about what would be a more integrated policy for land degradation 3.2 billion out of 7.5 billion people in the world today are adversely affected uh, by land degradation and loss of biodiversity and the estimate is it's costing 10 percent of world gdp so if it's wrong by a factor of 5%, factor of 3, 3%. These are big numbers, basically. The cost of inaction is incredible, basically. So when people talk about the cost of action, as we heard on the previous panel, think about the cost of inaction. And as Stern said in, the, you know, in his climate report a number of years ago, over a long period, depending on how you look at the discount rate, the cost of inaction exceeds the cost of action. And so we have to think about, basically. And so people say, oh, restoration. Really can't afford it. Very, very expensive. And indeed, there are lots of upfront costs of restoration. But what we showed in this report is there's a 10 to 1 cost-benefit ratio of a well-designed restoration. It increases employment. It promotes biodiversity. It promotes gender equity. And it, de and it can, in certain parts of the world, decrease violent conflict. Basically, only 25% of the world's land surface today is free of human alteration. Uh, by 2050, it'll be less than 10%. We have basically changed the, the Earth's surface completely, basically. And the last one, 34% of global biodiversity has been lost from a population standpoint. And it's, in, it's projected, at least this particular set of studies, to increase to 38 to 46% by 2050. Very, very similar, and I won't dwell on it. We looked at the drivers of land degradation, and once again, predominantly what you see are the arrows are going up. So how much wilderness area do we have? That's in green here. That's the only place in the world where there's any wilderness left. Where have we lost species diversity? And depending on how purple it is, it's anywhere from no loss, that's white, to dark purple, 100%, not many of those, but lots of uh, 40, 50, 60% loss of species richness. And the other one there down at the bottom, soil organic carbon. We're losing soil organic carbon in most parts of the world. So, big linkage between climate change and land degradation. Land degradation is responsible for a lot of emissions of carbon dioxide. Deforestation alone is somewhere around 10% of all that greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not just an energy problem. It is also a land problem. It's an agricultural problem with methane and nitrous oxide. Halting and reversing land degradation can be a very cost-effective way of trying to sequester carbon dioxide and hence mitigate human-induced climate change. It isn't a solution in itself, but it can play a key role. So that's the situation. Hopefully we're a lot better situation on climate. Uh, the answer is no. We're actually in a worse shape on climate change, in my opinion. This actually says, you know, for a few years, 2014, 15, 16, global emissions seem to plateau, 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 plateau. Uh, 2017, they went up again, and they went up again in 2018. So there's a short-term hiatus of greenhouse gas emissions going up. It's largely because the global economy wasn't doing very well, basically. The next one, Dan, is just what all of those green countries. They looked like they were doing well in 2014, 15, and 16. But in several of them, 
such as China, which was uh, sort of plateauing a little bit. Uh, they've gone back up again quite considerably in the last two years. And so basically the message is emissions are still going up, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases is also going up. This simply shows you the sort of world we at least need is uh, the RCP uh, 2.6. The other word for that is a low emission scenario. And if so, we can probably limit human-induced climate change to around 2 degrees Celsius, maybe less. But if we have uh, high emission scenario, the one on the right, 8.5, we're going to see huge changes in climate. Globally average, 3, 4, even 5 degrees Celsius. Land areas warming more than the oceans and high latitudes warming more than the equatorial regions. We're going to see major changes in precipitation. The wet areas of the world are going to get wetter and the dry areas are going to get drier. Very perverse, but that's the way. And the data to date actually backs up these theoretical calculations. So why do we actually care? What are the impacts? Well, the obvious thing is the lower you have changes in the Earth's climate, a 1.5 world is better than a 2 degree Celsius world, which is a lot better than a 3 to 4 degree Celsius world. So we clearly have to worry about changes in precipitation, issues of floods, and droughts in the same geographic location, we would actually predict more floods and more droughts in the same geographic location. Human health adversely affected vector-borne diseases, water-borne diseases, heat stress mortality, effects on nutrition through adverse effects on agricultural productivity in developing countries, soil erosion, Sea level rise displacing potentially tens of millions of people in coastal areas, affecting coastal infrastructure. Um, ocean acidification, which is not climate change, is a separate issue on its own, albeit caused by uh, increases in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere being absorbed in the ocean, changing the pH or the acidification of the oceans, very adverse effects on coral systems, on shellfish, and even on fisheries generally, and of course extreme weather events. So, what did the Paris Agreement tell us? It's a very, very good agreement. It said we should limit global temperature increases to be to below 2 degrees Celsius, and we should aim for 1.5. It says greenhouse gases should peak as soon as possible. There's a recognition we need to adapt. We've already changed climate, and more climate change is inevitable, but we can try and limit it. And therefore, and developed countries will provide financial resources. Now, if you believe that one, then you believe in the tooth fairy, in my opinion. Um, so what do we need to do? Well, we've got a baseline, as you can see, between now and 2050, where the emissions go up tremendously. Uh, this is CO2 equivalent. We take into account the other greenhouse gases, such as methane, nitrous oxide. To get to a two-degree world, we have to be, uh, by 2050, down somewhere around 20, 22 gigatons per year against a projected baseline, if we do nothing, of about 80. So this expands it, and I only go out to 2030. That's the baseline in 2030. This is where we need to be for a two-degree world. Current policy might get us to about 60. So instead of about 64, we go down to about 60. And then we have under the Paris Agreement conditional and unconditional pledges. Unconditional means countries will do it anyway. Conditional means we need technology and we need financial support. And that might bring us down there to, you know, 56. But look, we're nowhere near what we need for a two-degree world. The current pledges are just not adequate for a two-degree world, let alone a 1.5-degree world. So, the Paris Agreement is an important step. We've already increased global mean surface temperature by about one degree. It's increasing at roughly 0.2, degree, 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. Could be as low as 0.1, could be as high as 0.3. This means we're going to pass the aspirational target of 1.5 by the mid-2030s, 
and we'll pass the two degree target by 2050, 2060. So without significant additional action in the very near term, we're on a pathway to over three degrees Celsius. Most countries are having a hard time meeting the current pledges, let alone doubling or tripling the current pledges. The 1.5 degree report was a very good report from IPC. Technically feasible, yes, but there is no political will. Even the emissions in France and Germany went up last year. And they're probably the two countries more than any other country in the world that really take climate change seriously, basically. The rate of decrease that we would need to achieve either of the Paris targets, 1.5, is much faster, much harder, the rate of decrease than has ever been changed, even on a small scale, let alone a global scale. We would have to peak well within the next decade if we want to achieve 1.5. And you could just have to look at what's happening. We're not going to make it. Clearly, I've already said it, emissions in 2017 and 2018 are indeed going up, not going down as we need them to go. And the only way you can think of getting back to a 1.5 world and potentially even a two degree world is you go past the target and then we produce our electricity with bioenergy coupled with carbon capture and storage. That means you use bio biofuels to produce electricity. You capture the CO2 before it gets into the atmosphere. And therefore, what you have is electricity with negative emissions. Technically feasible, never been shown on a very, very large industrial scale, but it is promising. Don't misunderstand. But if you go to the scale needed to reverse an overshoot of 1.5 or 2, you would potentially adversely affect biodiversity around the world, food security, and water security around the world. So in other words, it could be an unintended consequence that as you use bioenergy coupled with carbon capture and storage, it may be a solution or part of a solution for climate change, but it could adversely affect biodiversity and food and water security. So when we think about climate change and biodiversity, we must think about them as a coupled system, and we can't think about what will I do for climate, what will I do for biodiversity? They, they have to be looked at together. So what are the implications of climate change, biodiversity, land degradation? They affect poverty adversely all over the world. They affect agricultural production. Therefore, they undermine food security. They absolutely, all three, directly or indirectly, adversely affect human health. They adversely affect water and sanitation. They undermine infrastructure. They exacerbate inequality because it's the poorest of the poor that suffer most. So talking about trying to reduce inequality, it will make inequality even worse, which is why it is a major ethical, or they are more on one issue, ethical, moral and ethical issues. Clearly, we need to have safe cities, but boy, we have to design them very differently to the way they're designed today. And I've already talked about, we clearly are not going to be able to safeguard terrestrial or marine biodiversity unless we make some big changes. And it can lead for actually to violence in some parts of the world. And therefore, it will not lead to peaceful, peaceful and inclusive societies. What we did, and again, if anyone wants these slides, they can have them. We looked at effectively what were these nature's contributions for people and we blocked them of how they affected different uh, sustainable development goals. So there's a, a certain block that affects food security, another block at social infrastructure, etc. And so again, one needs to look at this in detail. But then we looked also at land degradation. Um, if indeed you want to maintain that biodiversity, 100% you've got to get rid of land degradation. And so we looked at effectively what were the implications of land degradation on all, all of the sustainable development goals. And our view was literally all of them are very vulnerable to land degradation. So what's needed? And these are three quick slides. We need governments 
and I've really said this already, in partnership with the private sector and civil society to aggressively address the issues of human-induced climate change, loss of biodiversity and land degradation. Therefore, we need coalitions across sectors. We need partnerships between governments, the private sector and civil society. And we need both a short and a medium and a long-term uh, uh, approach to policy formulation. The first challenge for governments is government departments need to recognize that climate change loss of biodiversity and land degradation is critical to their department, and most don't. Uh, this is also important for their constituents in the private sector. And so also. Secondly, government has to recognize policy is stovepipe. The energy department doesn't talk to the agriculture department, doesn't talk to treasury in most governments, well, including this one. Um, third challenge is we need to quantitatively have a better understanding of the links between climate change, loss of biodiversity, and each of the sustainable development goals. As I said, we know enough to do a lot better, but more research will allow us to put together better response options. We actually need a common vision, and the vision in the US will be very different from the vision in Uganda or the vision in Mali or an indigenous tribe in the Amazon. So each, and of course a vision for, uh, for sort of Colorado is probably very different from California or Massachusetts. So we need visions from the local to the regional to the national to the, uh, uh, to the global perspective. I've already said it, we need everyone to work together. We need a strong evidence base. Good evidence is a necessary condition for informed policy, uh, but not sufficient. There's lots of other things that come in to good policy beyond just scientific evidence, but without good scientific evidence, and that includes social sciences. Someone earlier said we didn't put enough effort into social science. Absolutely correct. It's totally distorted the amount of money that's spent on the natural sciences versus the social sciences versus humanities. We need far more money spent on the social sciences without any question. We need to get everyone involved in co-design and co-production of policies. And we actually need to quantita quantitatively understand the indirect drivers, such as economic growth, demographic change, and the direct drivers. What's the relationship in order to develop the right response options? Thank you very much. Thanks for a great presentation. Uh, Keith Postian here at Colorado State University. So a question I have is um, the World Bank estimates that somewhere on the order of, seems high to me, but World Bank guys said it, uh, something on the order of like $500 billion a year globally of subsidies uh, go into agriculture worldwide. And a lot of that money, in fact, drives unsustainable practices in land degradation. So people talk about, do we need incentives for farmers, ranchers to change their practices, be more sustainable, provide these ecosystem services and food, fiber, et cetera? Can we reallocate some of the money that's already being invested a huge amounts globally and accomplish that, or is that a, you know, a fool's errand? There's no question there are agricultural subsidies, half a trillion to a trillion dollars a year, energy subsidies, transportation subsidies, all three of those subsidies lead to multi-trillions of dollars per year. They are all unsustainable. They don't help the poor. They help someone, the middle person. Uh, they all adversely affect uh, ecosystems. They all adversely affect climate change and land degradation. 
and the, the four regional assessments uh, all say it's one of the first things that we should try and do is to eliminate these subsidies. But boy, the vested interests that try and protect those subsidies that are just phenomenal. So you're absolutely correct by implication. We should reduce them or eliminate them. But boy, there are some real vested interests, some real power symmetries that defend those subsidies in literally every country of the world. So yes, that would be a major step in the right direction. So when people say there's not enough money to transition to a low carbon economy or to be a more sustainable agricultural system, there's plenty of money. It's the way it's being used at the moment. And the biggest misuse of money, or one of the biggest misuses, is the subsidies. Hi, thank you for that uh, very realistic view <laughs> of the future. Uh, did have a question, a couple of questions. One, uh, my name is Leroy Poff. I'm a, an aquatic ecologist here at CSU. And one, one question is, uh, you mentioned that there was a replacement uh, of, nat of ecosystem services with nature's goods or nature's value. Uh, I, I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little bit, and then uh, maybe that's not such a, a big issue, but also from your perspective as the leader of an uh, you know, international scientific organization, how do you see uh, getting the attention of policymakers? you obviously have experience interacting with those people at high levels, you know, in the Western, in the developed world, in order to make some of these sustainable development yeah. goals resonate with, uh, you know, people who are yeah. living very comfortable lives? Yeah. The first one, and it really caused an uproar in the scientific community, when we moved away from using the term ecosystem services or goods and services, and we haven't moved away completely from using it. Um, why did we move away from it? Our conceptual framework, if you remember, had what I call modern Western science, where you went from biodiversity and ecosystems to ecosystem goods and services to human well-being. But we also had the indigenous people, Mother Earth to nature's gifts, uh, to living in harmony with nature. The trouble was the term ecosystem services was very much linked to the Western view of the world. And we were trying to bring these two worlds together. And we felt that the term nature's contributions for people was more appropriate. We think that culture itself pervades everything. So when we talk about provisioning of food or material contributions to food, food is also a cultural issue. Water is a cultural issue. So we've actually, we've got in our new framework, culture pervades everything. Now it could have done, we could have done the same thing in my opinion with ecosystem goods and services and recognize it was a broader term. I don't see a monstrously big difference. These two frameworks can coexist to be quite honest. We should not be making a really big deal. I mean I'm on the paper and, as a minor author to be honest, not a major author, of how do we make the transition and we felt that it was easier to include indigenous and local knowledge and the humanities and some elements of social science into our broader framework than into the narrow one. Some people disagree with us, but it should not fragment the community. It doesn't matter which concepts you use, we're all saying the same thing. We're losing ecosystem services, we're losing nature's contribution people, we've got a problem. On the second one, uh, we have our meeting to finalize our global assessment uh, the very first week of May. I think it's the last day of April and the first week of May. At the end of that first week of May, envir the environments of the G7 are going to be meeting in Paris, just around the corner from us. And Macron has asked that G7 environmental ministers meeting to focus on making biodiversity and climate change two co-equal issues that effectively are critical for sustainable development. And he's hoping that there will be a declaration come out of it that would then be taken to the full G7 later in the year. I'd love to see what the American negotiators say about a declaration uh, that brings together climate change and biodiversity. Uh, your guess might be as good as mine. <laughs> Bob, yeah, it's good to see you again. 
Um, your first challenge that you put up there was the one that said, and I don't know if it was coincidental that it'd be the first one, but you, you said that the governments do not recognize it as being an important thing. I think that us as environmentalists, we have failed uh, miserably at precisely getting that message across. Um, in the work that uh, we've done uh, throughout the years, the decades, uh, the work at the World Bank, the work at several international organizations, we, um, the idea of trying to transform this uh, language of biodiversity into the decision-making language, which is a financial economic decision-making language. That is what makes the, that, that is where we make, it's ministers of finance that need to be enamored with biodiversity. Could you speak a little bit about that and how we're going to move forward on that? I couldn't agree more. When I worked in the World Bank, if someone had asked me as the environment director and then chief scientist, which minister would I want to meet first in any government? It would always have been the finance minister. They have huge power. After that, it would have either been the energy minister and or the agricultural minister, two of the major sectors that cause environmental damage. The last person I'd probably want to meet would be the environment minister. I'm hoping that that person is on my side to start with. I shouldn't have to convince them we've got a problem, although there have been a few environment ministers in England in the past that were actually de deniers of climate change. Uh, there were three in a row after I left DEFRA. The two I had, Hilary Benn and... Um, yeah, Caroline Spellman was superb. One from Labour, one from Concern. They cared of how you brought together climate change, biodiversity, and agriculture. They really, really cared. The next three after them, uh, two of the three were outright climate deniers. The current one, Gove, who could conceivably become Prime Minister, was not an environmentalist when he took over DEFA, but he's doing an excellent job of bringing environment and agriculture together. Uh, he realizes uh, that you know you need both. and they have to. So I believe the economics is an incredibly important thing, but it's not at the expense of recognizing there are non-economic values, there are social and moral values. Um, and it has been a fight in it, Bess, I have to be quite honest with you, and that is there's a bunch of social scientists that don't believe you should ever have any economic valuation of our the, well, market value, obviously, by definition, there are. Um, but they don't believe we should try and put economic value on non-market things such as climate change, air pollution, etc. I think they're totally wrong. Um, they feel that you're putting a price on nature, which we're not. We're just saying nature has economic value. And therefore, you t give that information directly to the environment minister. So when he meets the energy minister, the uh, agriculture minister, and the treasury, he can say, look, guys, this is real money that we're talking about, as well as the social and moral uh, implications. So uh, I really do believe the challenge, and that's why I think the best hope for biodiversity, and a lot of purists don't like what I say, is the best chance we've got of actually sustainably using and restoring and maintaining biodiversity is to show it is a development issue, it is an economic issue, issue, it is a security issue, it is a human health issue, as well as a moral and ethical issue. We're going to have to bring it to a close with that. Uh, we all join me in thanking our speaker.